Today we want to continue our series in Ecclesiastes. The title of the entire series is Wisdom, New Life Under the Sun. And notice how sun is spelt. It's not S-U-N, it's S-O-N. Because one of Solomon's favorite phrases in this book of Ecclesiastes is that there is nothing new under the sun, S-U-N. Talking about how life seems meaningless. It has no value apart from being in relationship with God. So if you were with us last week, or especially if you weren't with us last week, what we did was we looked at the first 11 verses. And uh, just as a reminder, remember we said from last week, this is a wisdom book. And biblical wisdom, not just in Ecclesiastes, but in all parts of the Bible, biblical wisdom is not your IQ or how much of a genius you are. Biblical wisdom comes by applying God's truth in practical situations. You don't have to be a genius. You just have to know God and know what God wants you to do and do it. That is the wise person. And the opposite is the fool. And the fool is the one who says, there is no God. Whatever God says to me, I'm not going to do. That is foolishness. But wisdom is knowing God and living in a way that pleases him. That is true wisdom. So last week when we looked at the first 11 verses, sort of a summary for the whole book, what we discovered was this. Apart from God, you will gain nothing from all your efforts. In other words, when we take God out of the equation, stuff doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And so we're going to continue that theme. That's really the theme of the whole book. But now, to use a computer term, Solomon wants to drill down. He wants to drill down on that and say, let's, let's go deeper on that. Let's examine that a little bit more. And so today, we want to look at the longest section. And don't be alarmed. My legs are too sore, too sore to preach too long today. But... We want to answer, or Solomon wants to answer for us a question, one of the most fundamental questions in life, and that is, what is the meaning of life? Now, Michelle did a great job with this picture. You see the sun in the background and the guy under the sun? She is so clever. Look at that. Very good. But today we want to look at this topic of what is the meaning of life? Because everybody asks this question, why am I here? What's the purpose of all this? I didn't ask for this. Why am I here? What's my purpose? And whether you know Jesus or you don't know Jesus, everyone asks themselves this question. And so today we want to look at God's word from the book of Ecclesiastes and see what Solomon, the wisest man in the world, has to tell us about this question. So before we look at the details, let's take a moment and bow for a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you so much that you sent Jesus. By sending him, you showed us that you love us. You showed us that we matter you showed us that there is meaning in this life because you wouldn't, frankly, have wasted your time in sending him to save us if we didn't matter. And so we thank you for Jesus. We thank you that, as Colossians says, in him are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And so now as we look at Ecclesiastes chapter 1 and chapter 2, I just pray that you would open our eyes to, again, see your truth, that we would be drawn to you, that we would be drawn to following after what your word says, and that you would be glorified when we find our satisfaction in you. So cleanse my lips now to speak your truth, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. 
Several years ago, there's a famous, I don't know if I'd call her a jazz singer or a pop singer from many, many, many years ago. Her name was Peggy Lee. Peggy Lee's a good singer. She's got all sorts of songs about I'm a woman and anyway, that's irrelevant. But she has this one song that fits the sermon today. And the name of the song came out in 1969. It's called, Is That All There Is? And it's sort of a talking song that leads into a chorus that she sings, and then there's more talking, and then another chorus, and so on. And I'm not going to read the whole song to you. I'm definitely not going to sing the song for you. But at the beginning of the song, she's talking. Music is playing in the background. And she says, when I was a little girl, we had a fire in our house. And when that fire came, my dad picked me up and took me outside. And I looked at the fire, and my whole house burned down. And I asked the question, is that all there is? And then the second verse comes, and I'll read that one to you. She says, And when I was 12 years old, my daddy took me to the circus, the greatest show on earth. There were clowns and elephants, dancing bears, and a beautiful lady in pink tights flew high above our heads. And as I sat there watching, I had the feeling that something was missing. I don't know what. But when it was over, I said to myself, is that all there is to the circus? Is that all there is? Is that all there is? And this is the sad part. If the first part wasn't sad enough. If that's all there is, my friends, then let's keep dancing. Let's break out the booze and have a ball if that's all there is. Then she goes on and talks about, I got a boyfriend, and the boyfriend dumped me, and I thought I knew love, but I really didn't. Is that all there is? And here's how the song ends. I know what you must be saying to yourselves. If that's the way she feels about it, why doesn't she just end it all? Oh, no, not me. I'm not ready for that final disappointment because I know just as well as I'm standing here talking to you that when that final moment comes and I'm breathing my last breath, I'll be saying to myself, is that all there is? Is that all there is? If that's all there is, my friend, then let's keep dancing. Let's break out the booze and have a ball. If that's all there is. Not a very happy song. <laughs> and frankly, what we're going to see, at least in the first part of what Solomon has to say to us here, <coughs> At the last part of chapter 1 and all of chapter 2, Solomon is going to take some time and he's going to do some experiments. And what he tells us is he's going to test the value of certain things, certain answers to this question. What is the meaning of life? And so he's going to start in verses 12 to 18 to test the value of what he calls self-centered wisdom. And then he's going to draw a conclusion. And then he's going to say, OK, let's do another test. Let's see about pleasure. If I make myself happy, if I focus on myself, making myself happy. Will that give me meaning? Will that Answer the question, is that all there is? Thirdly, he's going to talk in the middle part of chapter 2, verses 12 to 17, about self-centered morality, being a good person. And finally, he's going to talk about work in verses 18 to 23. But then finally, in verses 24 to 26, after doing all four of these tests, he is going to tell us what the right answer is. So let's have a look at these things. The first one, 
Solomon is going to test and talk about the value of self-centered wisdom. Here's what he says, beginning in verse 12. I, the preacher, have been king over Israel in Jerusalem. So we know this is Solomon talking, right? And here's what he says with his first test. I applied my heart to seek and to search out wisdom, all that is done under heaven. So first test. Okay, I'm the wisest person in the world. I am going to look and try to figure out this whole life. What is really important? What really matters? Everything that is done, and again, under heaven. I'm just going to, God's not in the picture here. God's out of the picture. I'm just going to try and figure out how the world works. What makes sense in this world? God doesn't have to enter into it. I'm just going to figure it out on my own. But even here, he's already saying at the end of verse 13, look what he says. It's an unhappy business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. Now, I don't think he's talking about life is an unhappy business. I think what he is saying is trying to figure out this world is an unhappy business. Paul, in the book of Romans, says the exact same thing. If you read Romans chapter 1, God has created the universe and everything in the universe declares his glory and his presence there. And people have decided that they are going to turn their back on God and they are going to substitute for him something else. Something else that they think will fill the void that is in their heart. Augustine calls this at the beginning of his, his uh, one book called The Confessions, Lord, we are restless until we find our rest in you. But people don't want that as an answer. They want to figure out something else. And so Romans 1 tells us that people look around and they substitute all sorts of other things. Calvin says that human beings are the greatest idol factories in the world. We make for ourselves idols and idols and idols, trying to substitute something for God and his presence in our lives. And none of those things satisfy. And so even here in verse 13, Solomon has to say, it's an unhappy business. People get frustrated. People get Later, he's going to use the word vexed because they cannot figure out how this world works apart from God. And so he says, it is an unhappy business that God has given to the children of men to be busy with. Everybody asks the question, what is the meaning of life? But few look to God for the answer. And so in verse 14, he's tried to figure out with his human intelligence and his human wisdom, trying to figure out how this world works. And in verse 14, we get the result. And he says, I have seen everything that is done under the sun. He's seen it all. And behold, all is vanity and a striving after wind. It's a vapor. It doesn't last. It doesn't have any value. It's just striving after wind. And then he has a little proverb in verse 15. What is crooked cannot be made straight, and what is lacking cannot be counted. If I'm trying to figure out how this world works, and I'm just trying to figure it out with my own ability, I'm not thinking about what does God want, what is God doing. I'm just thinking about what do I want, what am I doing. I'm never going to be able to get things straight. What is crooked cannot be made straight, and what is lacking cannot be counted. I am not going to figure it out. 
So what is his conclusion? His conclusion is, rather than trying to seek wisdom, just forget about it. Don't think too much. Don't pay too much attention to the details. In verses 16 and 17, we're not going to read them, but I'll summarize them because he repeats this pattern with all four things. He basically says, I became the best of the best at knowing human wisdom and experience, but I failed to find true meaning. And so he concludes this first section on self-centered wisdom by saying this in verse 18, for in much wisdom is much vexation or frustration, and he who increases knowledge increases sorrow. The more you know, the more frustrated you become, and the more you know, the more you realize that the world is a messed up place. Let's close in prayer. Thank you for... No. Terrible. Terrible. Now, again, let's try to understand what he's saying here. Solomon is talking to us as if God does not exist. And if God does not exist, or I act as if God does not exist, then I'm never going to figure it out. And what I will do is I will get more and more and more frustrated and confused and depressed because I'm only thinking my thoughts rather than God's thoughts. So I think if, I, if Solomon were here today and we asked him, what's the value of human wisdom? He would say, it's a fail. It's a fail. Secondly, and Solomon was a tremendous imbiber of this. He is going to examine the value of self-centered pleasure. And we had our scripture reading today. Lionel read it for us. Did you notice in the scripture reading today how many times Solomon said, I? I did this, and I did this, and I did this, and I bought this, and I made this, and I did this, and I bought this, and I did this. It's very self-centered. So what does he say about this? This is the beginning of chapter 2. I said in my heart, Come now, I will test you with pleasure. Enjoy yourself. But behold, this also was vanity. I said of laughter, it's mad. And of pleasure, what use is it? So, how many times have you heard people say, we're not here for a long time, so let's have a good time. We're not here for a long time, so let's have a good time. And the thinking is, if I can just give myself pleasure, whatever way it may come to me, that at the end, I will feel satisfied, that I will have found meaning in my life. If I just try to make myself happy. But already, even in the first mention of this, what does Solomon say? Behold, this also was vanity. And then, as Lionel read, he goes through various pleasures. He starts drinking wine. He builds various things. Now, remember, this is Solomon, the wisest man in the world, the guy who built the temple, the guy who made all these alliances, the guy who expanded the borders of Israel. And he goes on and says, he, you know, he did all these art things, made beautiful pools and had choirs come in and sing. He also had concubines and wives, all of these things to try and satisfy himself. And so what is his conclusion to all of this? He basically says, what a waste. What a complete waste of time. Because in verse 9 and 10, he says, I became the best of the best 
at seeking pleasure, but I failed to find true meaning. And his final conclusion on pleasure is this in verse 11. Then I considered all that my hands had done and the toil I had expended in doing it. In other words, I had done all these things. I had to work hard at making myself happy. And behold, all was vanity and a striving after wind, and there was nothing to be gained under the sun. I made myself enjoy so many things, but really, at the end of the day, it didn't mean anything. Making myself happy doesn't make me happy. Making myself happy doesn't make me happy. So then he thinks, in verses 12 to 17, hmm, I'll go on. And what I'm going to test this time is, I'm going to test the value of self-centered morality. Now you think, wait a minute, David, this is church. I thought we're supposed to be good. I thought we're supposed to be moral people. Well, what I want you to notice here is what he's going to talk about is self-centered morality. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about here. What makes a person good? Now, for some people, being good means whenever I change lanes, I use my turn signal. And when the light goes yellow, I don't speed through the intersection. I actually put on my brakes. And when the cashier at Superstore is rude to me, I don't yell and scream at her. I just think evil thoughts in my mind about her. I am a good person. And so here's what Solomon says about this, starting at verse 12, the life of self-centered morality. So I turn to consider wisdom and madness and folly. Now this is what I'm trying to get at here. On one side is wisdom, thinking about doing the right thing in a situation, and the other side he calls madness and folly. These two words often go together throughout the Old Testament, madness and folly. He's not just talking about being crazy. What he's saying is it's crazy or silly to give yourself over to sin. And that's what folly is. So I turn to consider living a good life versus living selfishly, just doing whatever I want, not caring about other people, not worrying about what they thought, not using my turn signal, not slowing down at the yellow light, yelling at the cashier when she's not nice to me. This is madness and folly. So he turned to consider, should I be a good person? Should I live a culturally moral life? Or should I just do whatever I want? Make myself happy. And other people, who cares? Because he asks a question. He says, for what can the man do who comes after the king? In other words, if I live just to be myself and do whatever I want to please me, I'm the king. Nobody's going to come to me and say, hey, king, you can't do that. You're the king. You just say, I'm the king. I can do whatever I want. He says he can only do what has already been done. And so in verses 13 to 15, again, without reading them, I'll tell you what it says. Solomon says, I became the best of the best. At trying to be a good person, I tried to be nice. 
But even in trying to be nice, I failed to find true meaning. Now, does that mean we're not supposed to be nice? No. Why did it fail to bring true meaning to his life? He tells us in verse 16, because everybody dies and is forgotten. In other words, if I'm a nice guy, if you're a nice woman, after you're dead, no one's going to run around saying, remember that guy, David? He was so nice. Remember David? He was nice. I liked him. He was nice. Maybe after you're dead for a little while, but after some time, everybody forgets you. So be a good person. Don't be a good person. At the end of the day, we're all going to be dead. Who cares? Again, what is he trying to get across here? He's not saying this is the right way of thinking. He's saying, without God in the picture, this is the conclusion that you will come to. Whether you're a good person, you're not a good person. Who cares? You're all dead anyway. And so what is his, what is the result of this? How does he feel? And what's his conclusion? And the answer is, I'm using a technical term here, yuck. He says, so I hated life. Because what is done under the sun without God, without factoring him in, without seeing what he wants me to do, without considering all that he has done for me, when I live my life under the sun, all is vanity and is striving after wind. So finally, he does one more test for himself. And the final test is work. What if I work really hard to try and build for myself something that matters? You know, a few weeks ago, the Stanley Cup finished, and everyone gets all excited because your name goes on the Stanley Cup, and they can't take that away from you. You will be remembered forever. And I always roll my eyes when they say that, because I think, tell me who won the Stanley Cup in 2012. That's 12 years ago. Now, if you ask me in 2013, it was the Boston Bruins, because I love them. <laughs> but if you ask me who won in 2012, I don't know. Who won in 2014? I don't know. And the other thing that they don't tell you is, you know those discs on the Stanley Cup with all the names on it? After se the oldest disc is 75 years ago, the league's over 100 years old. So in 25 years, all those names on that disc gets taken off and thrown away. So you're not even on the Stanley Cup forever. And people get in their mind, men especially, they think, I'm going to make my mark on the world so that I will be remembered forever. And Solomon does the same thing here. He says in verse 18, Thinking back now on all his life of work, he's thought back about, you know, all the pools and all the things that he made, and he says, I hated all my toil in which I toil under the sun, seeing that I must leave it to the man who comes after me. I can work and work and work and work and work, and I can get tremendous accomplishments. I can build a company. I can build a building. I can start a school. I can create a curriculum. I can do all sorts of wonderful things. But as soon as my, I'm gone, somebody else is going to take over and I'm going to be forgotten. And so he continues on to say, I was the best of the best at working hard. 
I think he would describe himself as a workaholic. I worked and 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 I worked. But at the end of all my work, I failed to find true meaning. Why? He tells us in verse 22. What has a man from all the toil and striving of heart with which he toils beneath the sun? Where does it get you? What does it get you? And here's his conclusion. For all his days are full of sorrow and his work is it vexation or is a vexation. Even in the night, his heart does not rest. This also is vanity, because I'm constantly thinking, ooh, what's, what's happening with my business? Is it going to fail? Am I going to go bankrupt? What can I do? What can I do? What can I do? What can I do? And working hard doesn't bring ultimate satisfaction to him. And in fact, at the beginning, he says, I hated all my toil. It just makes me full of sorrow, and I can't sleep at night. So clearly, working hard in and of itself isn't going to give me real meaning in life. So after these four tests, testing wisdom, testing pleasure, testing morality, and finally testing work, we get to verse 24 and 25 and 26 of chapter 2. And this is one of the few places where Solomon lays his cards on the table. And he said, I've told you all the mistakes that I've made. I've told you all the nonsense that I've done and all the results that came of it. But now let me tell you the right answer. He says in verse 24, there is nothing better for a person than that he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. And you say, boy, that Solomon, does he even listen to himself? He's just said that all of those things don't work. They don't work. But now at the end of verse 24 is where the real answer comes. This also I saw is from the hand of God. For apart from him, who can eat or who can have enjoyment? This phrase at the beginning of verse 24, he repeats it six times in the book of Ecclesiastes. There's nothing better for a person than that he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. But if I'm thinking below the sun, under the sun, thinking about myself, not including God in any of this, then I'm never going to figure out life and I'm never going to be satisfied. Because as he said in verse 25, apart from God, who can eat or who can have enjoyment? When God is not in the picture, life does not make sense. Life does not compute. Life does not work. So he goes on. As I said in verse 25, if we, if we try to discover the meaning of life but leave God out of the equation, our conclusion will always be distorted and illusionary. So he concludes this section of Ecclesiastes with verse 26 when he says this, For to the one who pleases him, 
God has given wisdom and knowledge and joy. When you come to know Jesus, when you give your life to God, when you live your life not under the sun, but to please the sun, S-O-N, to bring glory to God in your life, there is a tremendously drastic change that comes about. Because when you put God first in your life, the wisdom that you're relying on is not your own wisdom. It is the wisdom that comes from God's Word. It is the wisdom from the prompting of the Holy Spirit in your life to show you the right thing to do. And it gives you joy. Because now you are no longer living simply to please yourself. You are living to please God. Now you say, that doesn't sound very fulfilling. But in fact, the opposite is true. So if I ask the question, what should I do? What Solomon is telling us is that satisfaction only comes in knowing God. So when you are dissatisfied with your life, when you feel like your life is empty and you don't know what way to turn or what life is all about, the answer comes when we give our lives to Jesus. Because God sent Jesus to die on the cross for your sin so that you could then be in a relationship with God and not have to live just on your own merits and your own strengths. Jesus came, as 1 Peter says, to bring us to God. Died on the cross to bring us to God. So when you turn to God by faith in Jesus, something surprising happens. The very pleasures that once failed to satisfy you now help you find even greater joy in the goodness of God. So whereas Solomon said, wisdom failed him, human wisdom failed him, Jesus is described as the one containing in himself all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. If I need to know what is the right way to go, what is the right thing to do, what is the right way to think, I don't try to figure it out on my own. I look to God and ask him to help me. When I look at the pleasures that I enjoy in this life, if I think about how I can get them for myself, it only brings emptiness. But when I bring God in and I recognize that every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights. And God, as a good father, is not going to give you a stone or a snake. He is going to provide for your daily needs. So that when there's something in my life, the food that I have, or the job that I have, or the life that I have, and if there's anything good in it, my first response should simply be, thank you. Thank you, God, for all the good things that you are doing for me. When Jesus taught his disciples to pray, he asks them to pray for God to give them their daily bread. Yes, you may have a job, and yes, you have a salary, and yes, you go to the grocery store where the lady's rude to you, and you pay your bill, and all of that. But where does all of this come from? It comes from the gracious hand of God, and we need to recognize that. Same thing with our morality. I can't be a good person. I can't be a good person on my own. I need 
to depend on the Holy Spirit living in me, walking in the Spirit to live in a way that pleases God, and that is what will bring me joy. The same thing with work. <clears throat> Most people dream every day that they're at work of the day that they will retire and never have to work ever again. Now, I'm not saying retirement is bad. One day, 100 years from now, I hope to retire too. But in the time that you are working, God has given you this opportunity to work and to earn money, not just to help yourself, but so that you can bless others and that you can be a blessing to them in a variety of ways. So work is not a bad thing. It, too, is a gift from God. So to conclude, I want to read two verses, one from the Old Testament and one from the New Testament. Because we need to enjoy our life to the glory of God. John Piper, in his book Desiring God, calls this Christian hedonism. And in it he says, God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. Psalm 128, verse 1 and 2 puts it this way. Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. You shall eat the fruit of the labor of your hands, and you shall be blessed, and it shall be well with you. Notice what comes first and what comes last. When we fear the Lord and walk in his ways, then the fruit of our labor is blessed, and then it goes well with us. So Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 31, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that you did not leave us with the unhappy business of trying to figure out life for ourselves. Everyone asks the question, what is the meaning of life? And the answer is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. So may we, if there's anyone here today that doesn't know Jesus, that hasn't given their life to him, may today be the day when they say to themselves, I'm tired of trying to unbend the crooked branch that can't be straightened on my own. I need God in my life. And the only way I can be in relationship with God is through confessing my sin to him and taking Jesus' sacrifice for me on the cross. I pray if there's anyone here today that they would give their lives to Jesus today. And for those who know you and love you, may we truly show that we know you and love you by being thankful and grateful for all that you have done and may we experience that joy that comes in knowing that you are the good and faithful God. And may our lives show that meaning that comes in knowing you. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>